Sometimes you want to try different things and other times you want to try things differently. everyone. Welcome to another episode of Women Worldwide. Thank you so much for being here and for always tuning in. Well, today's episode is all about learning and taking learning to an innovative level. I sat down with my special guest, Dr. Martha Saunders, who is the president of the University of West Florida. Dr. Saunders has been in higher education, serving for over three decades, and she has held leadership and academic positions at universities in Florida, Georgia, Wisconsin, and Mississippi. And our discussion dove into what is innovative learning? What will university and innovation look like in the next 20 years? And what are those challenges? And we also talked about some of her aha and uh uh-oh learning moments. I could go on and on about Dr. Saunders, but I think it's time that she shares her journey and her advice with you. Dr. Saunders, welcome. Welcome to Women Worldwide. Thank you. It's great to have you here because I love education, number one. Innovative learning is such a great topic to dive into. But before we kind of go there, maybe you could just share... I always ask this first question, you know, with three decades of being in academia, what led you down this path to academia and innovative learning? Well, I I was a little late coming into the game. I did not come into higher ed right out of uh, undergraduate school. As a matter of fact, I was nearly 40 (laughs) when I got my doctorate, but uh, I had, I did other things. I worked in in industry. I worked for an advertising agency. I worked in the field of communication, and uh, then and then you know had my family and all of the complications that go with uh, juggling motherhood and oh, yes. and things like that. And so one day um, I was invited to teach as an adjunct. Uh, at a college where we were living. And I thought that sounded interesting uh, and got into that uh, first class and discovered that I loved teaching and I loved higher ed. And I had learned enough in my experience that I had something real to share with the students. So that's that was the start. And I never looked back. Oh, that's wonderful. I, it, it's refreshing to hear that you had a communications background and that you found this passion just by being an adjunct and being real. Taking that into the classroom is so important. How are you, that, that notion of real and getting to the heart of learning, I, I've been reading about you and your bio and, you know, it talks about your university being Florida's innovation university. How is this happening? How are you doing that? I think, I think it, it is real because it's very much part of our culture. Our university, we're one of the 12 universities in the state university system, and we are about 52 years old. But we, it's always been very much part of the culture, what I call the frontier spirit. And it may be because we're over here in central time. Now think about that. Florida is a big state. And, but part of us (laughs) are in central time. I didn't know that. Yeah. I did not know that. Florida. Okay. Uh, and as our mayor says, we're the Western gate to the sunshine state mm-hmm. where thousands live like millions wish they could. And oh, so, nice. I always have to say and, and so, uh, so we're over here and, and we're different. So I think in, in a lot of ways, we've always been challenged to figure things out. For example, if I have a statewide meeting, we always have to ask, 
is that Eastern time or Central time? <laughs> so, <laughs> I, you know, and, and that may not explain it at all, but it is very much a part of our culture that, that I call the frontier spirit. And what we have done over the years is we really have empowered our employees and our students to, to come up with new ideas. And, and we don't rely on ceremony. If you've got a great idea, shout it out and more than likely we'll give it a try. So I think it's, it's been very much part of the culture. And then when I came in as president, that was something I absolutely wanted to encourage because I think it's a strength of, of the institution. Oh, definitely. Well, well, first of all, the word different, if you are different, you cannot be status quo and you want learning to be different. You wouldn't want it to be status quo. You wouldn't want some cookie cutter type of education program. I think students today are really looking for that new frontier and it's very much about learning when you so step tapping into today's student um there's i'm sure challenges and there's opportunities but i would think even as you're attracting these students let alone what you have in the classroom right now but as you attract them getting that message out about the new frontier and how you're going they can be empowered how much of that is through the technology and the platforms where they like to hang out? We try to reach them where they are. Yes. And there, there are multiple sources for students and, uh, and every day they're inventing new ones for us. <laughs> and so one of the things I do try to do is to keep the narrative consistent. Even though I may have heard myself say something a hundred times, not everybody has heard the story. And so we, we keep the narrative simple and consistent, but we broadcast it over a variety of, of media. And social media, of course, now is, is so very important. We still do a lot of old fashioned stuff every now and then. I do a lot of just handwriting of notes. Oh, I think that's lovely. And, I really do. Uh, that's an art. And, and if, you know, as we're recruiting students, uh, and maybe for some of our top scholarships and they haven't committed uh, sometimes a note from the president that says, we just can't wait to see you on campus oh. in the fall. And, uh, and it makes a difference. So we, we go old school, we go new school and, uh, and whatever, whatever works. But I think the secret also is to make sure you're saying the same thing, no matter what medium you're using. No, that's a really good point. And, and I always said, even with social media coming on like a lion and all the choices that you have to communicate, if something's working, if you have a method and whether you call it old school or traditional, if it's not broken, don't try to fix it, right? Use it. If that handwritten note works, if that letter from the president, go, go with it. Absolutely. Absolutely. What do you think are some of the challenges, perhaps, of getting to being that innovative leader of higher education in the next 20 years? I think we, we are all struggling to, to keep uh, in to keep the attention. Mm. I I do worry sometimes that that the that people are not not everyone is valuing higher ed mm -hmm. um, it, it is more than just getting a job it certainly is a great contributor to getting a great job but it also makes you alive right. it helps you it helps you learn how to learn helps you figure things out and uh, of course, within higher ed, you, you make connections with other people that you have never met before. And so Your network. I, I do think the next 20 years, we, we will all try to struggle to remain relevant mm -hmm. to, uh, to the interest of, of our customers, of our students and, and our communities. And it is, um, it's a challenge. 
Yes. Do you think it was, how, how hard was it navigating COVID? Did you have to be outside of the classroom? Was it easy, tough? How, how, how did everybody do? Well, I, I was very pleased with us. <laughs> That's one good. of the, one of the advantages of being innovative is that you're ready for stuff like this. Nice. And we were early <laughs> adopters of distance learning. That's great. And and because we are here in hurricane world down here in Florida, and we understand that we could have an interruption of a week or two weeks or three weeks. So we had already designed uh, course shelves for every course we teach online shelves mm -hmm. and all the faculty had to do were just activate the shell oh my gosh and that that so is all, and it and it fully populates an online platform with the roster and the syllabus so they can just pick up and go so covid was certainly not something we were expecting right but it worked the same way it was all right we've got to leave campus we cannot be here we've got to do it somewhere else activate, you know, activate the system and let's roll. And I was so very pleased. We had uh, a, a couple of weeks of boot camp for our faculty who had never taught online. And it was just, I'd go and hang out. Not that I could help, but I just like to hang out. And, and they were so wonderful. And I'm sitting there and I'm listening to a music teacher, you know, trying to figure out how he's going to teach the violin <laughs> online and he's game. He's oh, that's great. Game. And, and, and he's, and of course he was saying, can we do anything about the sound? You know? oh. <laughs> <laughs> but they, it, it, no one, no one threw up their hands and said, no. we can't make this work. No one. No Even one. Was challenging. And so I think that for us, again, it, it was, helpful to already be ready for disruption. Well, that that's, may be, that may that's, be a great mantra for anybody in higher ed these days. Absolutely. I don't know how many uh, universities and colleges are, are, are following that mantra yet, but I'm amazed. That is truly showing the culture of the new frontier and the spirit that you have. It also reminds me, and because you were in communications, whenever we had to deal with a crisis back in the day, it was always that dark website that mirrored whatever you had or needed to be flipped on, flip the switch when crisis struck. So all the resources would be there. It kind of sounds like you were uh, ahead of the game <laughs> in that respect. I think we were certainly in, in technology. And I do remember those days where you kept your crisis plan in the trunk of your car. <laughs> because, uh, because you might, and it was this might thick. It was, it, oh, huge. And it, it would huge. separate you from your place of work. You couldn't be there. And so you had to have the plan and the, and we all carried it around in the trunks of our car. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just, I'm curious. I, I want to shift a little bit to ask you something maybe that you could share that you've learned over the course of your career. So okay. if you would share with the women, women worldwide listeners and viewers out there, maybe one of those big aha moments or an uh-oh <laughs> moment, if you don't mind, that has carried throughout your career. And this really helped you. Well, I think we all have uh -oh moments. Uh, and for me, uh, I, I'm just by nature a very positive person. And it, it struck me one day that not everybody is. Not right. like, oh, gracious. <clears throat> and, and not everybody is, not everybody is on your side. Hmm. And, and by that, I don't mean mine personally, I mean the institution side. And so what I, I came to the conclusion one day, because, you know, you're going into rooms and you're, you're either arguing for funding or something. And I think, well, I'm going to walk in there and I'm going to assume that they just love me to death <laughs> and, and that they are crazy about me 
and they're crazy about my institution and I'm going to behave that way because you do act differently. Yes, you, know, you, you do. Your friends that you know, love you, you're more confident, uh, you're more relaxed and, 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 and don't think too hard. Maybe they don't all love you, but pretend they do because you're going to perform better. And that might have been the one of those awakenings. And I wish, I wish I hadn't, I wish I'd gotten a lot of them younger. Yes, <laughs> you know? isn't that fascinating? I, I think I was caught up in my own noise and listening to my own voice. And uh, not a lot of other things got through until later. Well, that is so good to hear. First off, what you said about positivity, I know there's studies that say positive people live longer. <laughs> they do. So it's wonderful that to, to have that positive spirit. And also there is something about visualizing or bringing what you want to happen before it happens, because it does, it changes your composure. It changes the energy that you give off. And in those moments, and I do a lot of training and I bring energy to the table. When you have that high vibration energy that comes from a place of happy and hopeful and joy, you attract that energy. And that's really interesting. So that is excellent, excellent advice. And I like what you said about visualizing. And if you can take the time to paint the picture for someone <clears throat> or for yourself, how is this going to look? How's it going to taste? How's it going to feel? How's it going to sound when we get there? And you can create that, then you're going to just, you're not going to fail. Right. <laughs> because everybody's no. going to see it and they're going to want it. And, and, uh, and you're going to go forward and, and most likely get what you want. Well, Dr. Saunders, I think there should be a class in visualizing and some sort of positivity and alignment. <laughs> That's I, what know, I, I like to teach. Why, and, and I don't want to extend our meeting, but I, I, I have to say my dad was the best at that. Oh, that's so I, would nice. come, I would come home with whatever idea I had and he would not only, for example, I was going to be an opera singer uh, at some point in my childhood. Oh my! And I came home and said, daddy, I want to be an opera singer. And he, he didn't just say, that's a good idea. He would say, oh, that's a wonderful idea. And when you open in the Metropolitan Opera, <gasps> In New York City. Now, remember, we're in South Mississippi. Sure. It's far, far away. And uh, if when you open, uh, Mama and I are going to be there, and I'm going to buy her a long dress. Oh, my and I'm going goodness. To, I'm going to get her some opera glasses so she can see you real good. I'm I mean, picturing this. I can he, see this. He did that. And then the next week, I was going to be a cowgirl, and it started <laughs> all over again. But you know, and but he had that gift of immediately conjuring up uh, the the image of whatever it was you were talking about, and uh, it just meant the world. Oh, of course. Course. And it is best for the music industry that I did not go into. <laughs> I was just going to ask you, <laughs> but it's a good thing. <laughs> or, or the paddle industry. I wasn't a cowgirl either. But Well, I'm sure your, your university is very happy that you are the president. <laughs> that you're not a cowgirl or an opera singer. Or the, who knows? May, maybe you like to ride horses and you sing <laughs> on the side. Well, I do, the but not... Uh, not professionally, <laughs> not professionally. So let's talk a little bit more about, you, you mentioned your, your dad, that, that's a, amazing. As far as the visualization, you didn't go the, the cowgirl route or the opera singer, but you become president of a university. And there's a lot, I can only imagine what goes into your work week, what goes into your personal life I don't know. Give us a rating of some sort. Let us know. How are you doing with the work-life balance or blend? Today, <laughs> I think we're, I've, I've got it right. Uh, and, but it, it, I don't think anything is ever in perfect balance. Certainly at points in my career, I, where I was under a lot of pressure to finish that dissertation or get to tenure, uh, I, 
I mean, where there is, there are not enough hours in the day, but I had kids and I remember making a saw a commitment to myself and, and saying, we've, we've come too far together for me to throw you away now. Mm. Uh, and so even though I might have finished that dissertation a few months earlier, but I, I didn't work on the weekends. I went to soccer games and oh, good. whatever it was they had going on. And I was able to manage my work schedule pretty well so I could take chunks of time. But I took a little more time to get to the goal but I didn't have to sacrifice something terribly important. And so all along the way, I think I've kept in mind, uh, and of course now our children are grown and uh, on their own, uh, but I still have a husband (laughs) and I like him a lot. And (laughs) it's a priority. (laughs) And, uh, and so he, uh, I, I keep in mind that we still matter and, uh, I won't be president forever, but I hope to be married a long, long time. Awesome. So, uh, so I want to, uh, so I think I, 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 whatever habit I formed has been a good one. It's a good habit. You made good choices and priorities. That, that's the thing. We can always get to goal and you yeah. will. It's just, there's other priorities along the way that sometimes maybe goal might take a little bit longer, but it's worth it for those important relationships in life. My sister is a counselor and she often says, count the cost. Whenever you're, Mm -hmm. whatever you're doing, count the cost. That's right. Uh, I think that uh, that was always good advice and one that I I give to other people. (laughs) And, um, you know, I don't, almost nothing's worth throwing everything away for. That's right. And when I hear count the cost, I think of, opportunity costs. If you do one thing, you lose out on something else. And what is the most important thing to do? Well, and it's never going to be a perfect balance. There will be times you will be leaning in on your career and leaning away from maybe personal relationships or other things you like to do, but just get back and recenter periodically. Yeah. Oh, the realign, recenter. That is really important. You mentioned a, a time when you were under pressure, and I'm sure that pressure must be a part of the university president's day. So, <laughs> what do you do when you feel stressed? Are there any techniques or good practices that you have that you want to share? Well, I I walk, and and we uh, the campus. We're fortunate. The campus is 1,600 acres, and oh. it's, it looks more like a, a national park than a <sighs> campus. So lots and lots of uh, paths and things to walk around, and uh, and I see people out all the time, and it it really does help you de-stress if you can just walk out and away from the crowd. And so, and I also live on the beach. And oh, so that's I, nice. <laughs> we walk every morning. Uh, of course, we also bring a. Uh, litter bags and we pick up trash too. <laughs> it's not, it's not, all glamour. Too. <laughs> it's not all glamour, but, but just getting out and moving makes a yes. big difference to me. I'm a gardener and, uh, I, that is, I can get lost, uh, working in whatever I'm doing, pots or vegetables yeah. or whatever, whatever and, I'm working And on. gardening is exercise because I, I recently helped my mom in her garden and I'll tell you, you, you're using muscles and you're leaning certain ways that you're just not used to. I was exhausted. I, I realize that every weekend because I'm really out, you know, of course, more zealously uh, on a day off. And I thought, whoa, where did that pain come from? You know? Right, right. There's something about gardening too, being close to nature and the earth. They talk about grounding. I, I don't know. There are studies that help you, your energy. We talked about, uh, and I think I had written a, a blog on this, but uh, I've been reading about, I think they call it forest bathing. Oh. And, uh, but it basically is just going and immersing yourself in nature. Uh, for us, we don't have a lot of forests, but we do have beaches. And uh, my campus is wooded. And, uh, and uh, but just going, turning, every, unplugging things and just listening to the sounds, oh, and smelling the important. smells and 
Uh, and but there are quite a few studies on how therapeutic that is. Yes, I, I remember some study where they had heart patients who either <laughs> walked along the side of a road or walked in the forest in nature. And That's after awesome. the study was over, of course, the heart patients who walked along in nature, you know, the cholesterol was lower, less hypertension, you know, better heart rate as opposed, well, of course, if you're lo- walking on a road where cars are going by, it's, it's not to get hit. <laughs> exactly. But there is something to be said about the calming effects of nature. Definitely. Yeah. So I can hardly believe I'm going to ask you this question because it means we're rounding out our discussion. Can you share with the women worldwide audience a a little bit of parting advice? How can they raise their level of innovation or innovative learning so that they can achieve their passion and goals? Well, it, it, it's simple to just say, try new things, <laughs> but, but my advice is try new things. Right. And uh, one of my uh, trustees on my board says, it's, uh, she said, sometimes you want to try different things and other times you want to try things differently. Hmm. And, uh, and I thought that, you know, it's good advice. It's not always about throwing away your tried and true go-to uh, mechanics, but maybe apply them a little differently. And I, I love that, that quote, and she says it a lot. And, and I guess my other advice is it's really okay. And we do this all the time as we say, well, that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I say that a lot. <laughs> it, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> when you read about, you know, m- mega success stories of, major corporations that have hit it big with some product or other, what you don't read about is all the stuff that didn't work, but they had to try all the stuff that didn't work till they got to the one that did work. And, uh, and so I think that, and you gotta, you gotta be forgiving of yourself and just say, well, that didn't work. I also often say not every flower blooms, (laughs) (laughs) Well, That's so true. And you've got staff members who've tried so hard and they tried to launch something and they expected a different outcome. And, uh, and, uh, and certainly we don't, we're not reckless uh, and, we're, and we do our very best, but not every flower blooms. We're quick to observe it, m- move on. And, uh, and something even better will pop up. Oh, I, that's so positive. I love that. So try things differently. It's okay. That didn't work. And not every flower will bloom. Such great advice. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Where can people find out more about you and your <laughs> university? Well, oh, lots of places. I think the first stop would be uwf.edu. And there will just be a host of connections to me, the president, and anything you would want to know about uh, the university. And then I'm on uh, Facebook, Dr. Martha Saunders, or Dr. M.D. Saunders, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. Wow. <laughs> <All of> those- <laughs> You're a uh, cool president. <laughs> we, we've got it all. Well, they... I I have good tutors. That's so good. Well, I hope everybody connects with you. Dr. Saunders, thank you so much for sharing about your journey, your university and innovative learning and your new frontier. I I just think it's very positive, empowering, empowering. So thank you. Thank (laughs) Thank you you so much. And thank you to everybody for tuning into Women Worldwide. And you know what I always say, keep the conversations going and the feedback coming. I'm on Twitter. I'm at Dee Breckenridge. So you can give me a shout out there, ask a question, or of course, connect with me on LinkedIn. Okay, friends, until our next episode, stay focused, energized, and feeling empowered. Thank you.